So this topic is special to me as someone who is a person of color, who's half Mexican, half black, and a female. It impacts me personally daily, people that I love as well. So I'm gonna go over what bias is. Is it always something negative? Why do we even have biases and how we move forward from them? So the question, first question I wanna ask you is, do you think biases play a role in the decisions you make every day? The answer should be yes. If it's not yes right now, hopefully it is by the end of my talk, that's the goal. So I can't talk about biases without kind of briefly going over how the brain works. Our brain is tasked to process a lot of information throughout the day. And most of our actions usually occur without much thought. Uh, what we do is our brain creates categories or schemas, what is also called in literature, based on cues for different objects and things. Um, and we use these cues to then place an object into a category. Usually it does very well for us, um, but however, things can go wrong. So this is an example of a schema. Say you're walking your dog, being grizzly, on the trail, and the dog starts barking. You look over and you see something that's long and is rattling. Your brain then has this cloud of association based on the visual cues and auditory cues that you have in front of you. And what happens is you start to have these associations like this is a snake, it's probably dangerous, it can bite me, there's poison, venom, and it all can be very bad. And that causes you to react and essentially leave the situation. This all happens very quickly. Um, it doesn't take much time for this to happen. And so these clouds of association affect the way we see things and interact. This also can apply to our everyday lives in medicine. If I gave you three symptoms here, someone with short enough breath, they also have been complaining of lower extremity edema, and then you listen to them and they have crackles, most of you will probably instinctively think about CHF, right? That doesn't take much thought because you recognize patterns, you recognize these clouds of association with CHF, this diagnosis, has its own symptom symptomatology that allows you to efficiently think while working. Because if we had to process all this information and think critically throughout our shifts, that would be very exhausting and not efficient. So we use this process for things, but we also use it for humans and people. So we place people in categories based on what they look like, their race, their profession, their religion, their gender. Um, and this can be pretty risky because we'll all get into that in a slide or two. Um, and these categories that we place people in are usually based on stereotypes and attitudes. Most times, like I said, our judgments that we make on things and people usually are okay. However, sometimes it can cause life-threatening error. Like, for instance, if you are a black male and you're carrying Skittles and a can of Arizona iced tea that gets mistaken for a weapon and you get shot and you die. This is the story of Trayvon Martin, um, and it actually is a story of many others, not just him. And so one might ask, what causes one type of group to be at risk for these life-threatening errors to keep reoccurring? And the answer is that we place people in categories, and whatever category we, category we place them in influences how we react to them. 
And so, like I said previously, we place people in categories based on stereotypes. So what is a stereotype? Stereotypes refer to beliefs that certain attributes, characteristics, and behaviors are typical to a group of people. Sometimes these stereotypes can be self-perpetuating. Um, some examples of some stereotypes that get thrown around for different race groups. So Asians are thought to be very smart, get straight A's in school. Um, for black people, I put up quite a few here. Black people are often admired for their ability to entertain, whether that be through sport or music. Um, and the problem with this is that people don't see black people for the rest of their work. And the issue with that also is you have these young kids who see black people occupying this space and largely occupying the space of entertainment and think that's all they can be because they don't see black people in these other arenas. Some other common stereotypes are the angry black woman as well as the black criminal. So the black crim like black criminality is an issue because it is something that contributes to the fact that if a black man is carrying a non-weapon, it is more likely to be misinterpreted for a weapon as opposed to a white man carrying a non-weapon. And a lot of times this black criminality comes from what we see in the media because black people are often portrayed as the criminal and non-black people are usually portrayed as the victim. And if you don't interact with very many black people, that's all you have. And that's how you create your ideas, your judgments, and how you categorize people. This is a um, study that I saw while I was researching, which I thought was interesting. So if you, it showed that if you were, or not this one, but prior studies have shown if you are a tall male, you usually benefit in success and salary. When they looked into this further, they realized that most of these studies were done on white men. And so when they looked at black men, they found that it's actually the quite opposite. So if you are black and tall, you are perceived as a threat and will likely have more interactions with the police. So the combination of stereotypes with attitudes and attitudes are the gut feelings you have about somebody are what create bias. There's two different types of bias. There's explicit and implicit. Explicit bias is something that we directly outwardly express. It is, we have control of it. It's something that we can conceal if we feel the social or political space that we're occupying. It's not appropriate for that. We can hide those explicit biases. Whereas implicit bias is something that we don't have control over. It is, it acts through our subconscious. It's very pervasive and the big thing here is that it can conflict with your expressed beliefs. So it may not necessarily align with um, what we declare. And that's why it can be dangerous. So why bias is important is because it predicts our behavior in real world class, in, in the real world from classrooms to courtrooms to hospitals. And for us, that's really important. Right, because it can interfere with our clinical assessment of patients, our decision making, as well as our provider and patient relationship, such that health goals are compromised. And when that happens, it tends to leave a space for health disparities. And one of the most relevant health disparities that we are currently seeing is with COVID. So this is a um, chart that the New York Health Department put out with some numbers that they've seen. And as you can see, this top here is black people. And so they have more COVID cases than any other race group. Um, they are often, or they're hospitalized more often than others, and they are more likely to die as well. 
and this is a problem. The other big reason why bias is important is because it creates barriers to opportunity and can operate in conjunction with structural racialization. What is structural racialization? It's essentially when a system is set up for racial inequality without a explicit racial intent. And I really like this little picture here because sometimes people fail to realize, yeah, we may be running the same race, but I have a lot more obstacles to get past than others. And so this guy is saying, what's the matter? Is the And I can't talk about implicit bias without talking about um, structural racialization or structural racism because they interplay on each other. And so if we start here on this left side, this is talking about associations and assumptions, which is essentially bias that we have, um, which then creates history, policies, and practices, which then affects outcomes and we have racial disparities. And because of these inequalities and racial disparities, that kind of feeds into the biases that we have about people. So for example, if I'm talking about education, um, people might think, oh, black people aren't smart, right? Because they don't see very many of them at Harvard. But the problem is, is black people live in communities that don't have great school systems. The resources are lacking, and that's a structural thing. That's a system thing. But then, which creates more racial disparities, and because I don't see all the black people at Harvard, that reinforces this bias that I have that black people aren't smart. For example, I do not have that bias. Um, I saw this on social media, and I actually really like it because, oh, that thing, this is supposed to be over here. But it kind of has us take a step back and look at where we are in history, we forget that black people were oppressed for so long and it wasn't actually that long ago when you look at our history. So we had 339 years of slavery here, then segregation for 89 years, and we are here, right? A little over 60 years from explicit laws that were to oppress black people. But yet our system is still set up and designed this way. We haven't moved very far. So I actually put this over this green because I don't think we're in this stoplight green yet. I think we still are in this in between color, yellow and green. And hopefully with what's going on this year, we can start to move towards a greener block there. So I talked about bias. Now, how do you assess your bias. There's a study or there's a test you can take. Dr. Finney talked about it last week. It's called the implicit association test. I highly recommend everybody take it because we all have bias and it's important to know where you stand. And there's different categories. There's race, gender, religion. You can decide which one you want to take. Um, the test on race, it actually shows that a significant majority of white people but a significant majority of white people prefer European faces over African American faces. I took the test. I was not happy with my results. This is mine here. So as you can see, I have a slight preference for European Americans over African Americans, which is a majority of people who take the test. This, that's that pink area here. And like I previously said, implicit bias doesn't always necessarily align with what your desired expressed beliefs are. This is not my, this is not how I feel and what I express, but yet it's still one of the biases that I have that I need to work on. We can, I also took the, the one on gender, which shows I also have a slight preference for males, associating males with careers as opposed to females and careers, which aligns with the majority of the people who take this test as well. And there's different, um, level so you can have no preference, light preference, moderate preference, or strong. I'm close to little to know, but I still have work to do. So the 
take home point of this is I want you guys to understand that biases are stories that we make up about people. They're assumptions we make up about people before we actually get to know who they are. So I want to leave you with five different things you can do or I would like you to do um, after hearing this talk. So the first is to acknowledge that bias influences, influences our everyday decisions that we make. The second would be to take this test to see where you stand. The third would be to start to take inventory of your circle. See who you hang out with, who you surround yourself with, and figure out which person is missing from that circle. And I encourage you to go out and form genuine relationships with that person so that you can assess your bias and assess what assumptions you're making. Fourth would be to walk towards your discomfort because this is not going to be a comfortable thing. These discussions are hard to have, um, but I want you to no longer sit in your comfort because that is what makes us stagnant. Embrace the discomfort so we all can grow. And then lastly, I want you to use your privilege. So it's a privilege to be educated about racism and not have to experience it. And so I want you to say something if you see or hear something, say something. And I acknowledge that I have a privilege as someone who's half black and half Mexican. I can pass for many different things. Not everyone automatically assumes that I'm black. And so I sometimes occupy spaces that other people or other black people often can't get into. And so I am taking advantage of this opportunity to educate people and I would highly encourage you to do the same and use your privilege essentially because enough is enough and I'm tired of hearing the same story with the different name. It could be my brother, my dad, my cousin, who's next. It can be your patient and so I would like you to, if not for anybody else, to do these things for your patients.